Okay, so uh, we are very delighted to uh, introduce uh, Xia Guang Wang. So Xia Guang is a professor um, of uh, electronic engineering in Chinese University of Hong Kong. His group has uh, worked on uh, deep learning and computer vision has, and has done many great works. Uh, in particular, his group achieved near human performance in face recognition, uh, such as over 99% in uh, labeled faces in the wild data set. And also his team has achieved top entries in large scale object detection challenges in recent years. So today, Xiaoguang will talk about deeply learned face representation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, feature representation for face recognition. So in the past uh, two years, uh, uh, deep learning has boosted the performance of face recognition substantially. So on the well-known face recognition benchmark, LFW, and uh, the face verification accuracy has been improved from 96% uh, to almost uh, perfect, and even surpassing the human performance on this benchmark. So in this talk, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about how to learn the face representation from the uh, classification and uh, multiple reconstruction task. And uh, given the high performance network, I'm going to uh, present some empirical study on the properties of the neural responses. And uh, making use of such uh, properties will show that uh, we can make the, uh, reduce the size of the network uh, uh, substan uh, substantially while keeping the recognition performance. It also has some other uh, interesting applications. So currently, uh, the most uh, common way uh, is to learn the facial representation is uh, through this uh, uh, identification task. Basically, given an input uh, uh, t uh, training image, uh, goes through the covenant, it's uh, classified as a, uh, one of the large number of face identity class. And uh, so the, uh, in the top layer, the neurons in the top layer, they are the uh, feature representation we want to learn. So they capture the rich interpersonal uh, face variations because they need to classify a large number of uh, uh, faces and uh, they are uh, discriminative and also can be well generalized to new identity outside the training data. So also uh, on top of this, we also add the verification signal. So it basically, if uh, you have two images from um, the same person, we require the, their learned feature representation to be similar. So this verification and uh, identification signal, they are jointly added to the uh, multiple layers to learn the feature representation. We can also learn the uh, feature uh, face representation through uh, reconstructing multi-view representation. We know that uh, uh, in face recognition, the view variation is a major factor affecting the performance. So we, in this network, given an uh, input of image in the arbitrary view, we want to reconstruct uh, all the viewpoints of the same person. And here I'll show you the examples. These are recon reconstruction results, and these are the, the ground truths. And the training and the test data, they have no overlap on the, on the identity. So in the network, we uh, the identity and the uh, view representation, they are represented by uh, different sets of neurons, so you can separate uh, the identity features and the viewpoint features. Also, the viewpoint has a continuous uh, representation. So this is our network structure, the X and Y, they are input and output uh, face images in uh, different viewpoints. And uh, this uh, H, uh, HID, they are the uh, neurons encoding the identity information of uh, uh, the input image uh, X, it uh, removes the uh, viewpoint information from X. They are the deterministic neurons. And this uh, H, uh, HV, they are the new random neurons encoding the viewpoint information of the output image. They are sampled from uh, uniform priors. And this uh, HR, these are neurons encoding the features of the uh, uh, output image Y. So it uh, combines both the identity information and the viewpoint information. Actually, this, uh, uh, you can see this network is a combination of deterministic neurons, also random neurons. And this uh, HV, this uh, V2, these are the uh, identity features. They are uh, useful for face, uh, uh, face recognition. And this uh, uh, viewpoint label can be inferred uh, from uh, output image as well as from these uh, random neurons uh, encoding these uh, uh, viewpoints. So we can use EM to update the probabilistic model on the network. 
uh, it corresponds to the forward and the backward propagations. So at the each step, we infer the values of the random neurons, which encode the viewpoint information. And at M step, we use to update the parameters of the network. And because we have a continuous view representation, and it can, we can interpolate and predict the images under the viewpoint unobserved in the training data. And in this example, our training data only have zero degree, uh, 30 degree, and uh, 60 degrees. In A, we want to reconstruct uh, the image, uh, face image under 15 degree and 45 degree uh, new viewpoints. And this is reconstruction result, and these are the ground truths. And in B, our input image are, uh, under the 15 degree and the 45 degree, we want to reconstruct the front view. And you can see that uh, uh, even we observe some uh, new viewpoints because we can interpolate the images, they can be reconstructed well. So actually this uh, idea can be also generalized to other factors besides the, uh, uh, besides the viewpoints, and uh, such as the ages, expressions, the lightings, et cetera. Actually, you can also uh, jointly consider multiple factors. Here, I, I give you an example. Uh, given an arbitrary face image as input, we can uh, reconstruct different uh, combination of uh, the poses and the expressions. And in this example, uh, we construct the face image on the different combinations of lightings and expressions. And given this, um, uh, a uh, high performance neural network. And uh, some people think this deep learning is you uh, simply use a uh, large number parameters to feed the data. So we are interested in uh, studies the properties of the uh, response of the neurons. And actually these properties are naturally owned through large scale training. We, we don't add uh, uh, explicitly uh, add some regulation, uh, regularization to the, to the model. Here, given an uh, input image, and we look at the uh, neural response in the top hidden layer, and then you can see that uh, some neuron are responded and some uh, have no response. It's not surprising we have this uh, sparse representation because we use rectified linear units uh, as act activation function. If you, if you add some occlusion and uh, change the viewpoints of the same person, we observe that this magnitude could be uh, relative, uh, can change to some extent but the activation pattern could be, uh, is, uh, is relatively uh, stable. And if you change uh, the identity of the person, we find out uh, the, the activation pattern, uh, zero one pattern, is going to be changed substantially. So this uh, inspire us, we just uh, use the binary code from this uh, activation pattern for face recognition. And the result is uh, uh, pretty uh, promising, we still, uh, even you use this uh, binary code, we still can get a very high uh, recogni face recognition performance on, uh, over 99%. So this uh, implies that uh, the activate, activation pattern may be even more uh, important than, that, than this uh, magnitude. Also, it has import, uh, it's important for applications because if you use this binary pattern for recognition, it's going to save a lot of uh, storage and also the computation time. So if you look at an uh, input test image, and we observe that about a half of these neurons are responded and the other half, uh, half have no response. So if we want to, you want to compare the high mean distance of the activation pattern from two phase images, and this moderate sparsity response can give you the maximum distance uh, between these two images. On the contrary, if you have the phase um, representation, which, uh, which is a highly sparse, most of the neurons has zero response, and then their distance will be small. You're going to waste a lot of bits. And if you look at a particular neuron, we observe that on the test image, and about a half of the image have responses, and the other half have no response. So it means that it can maximize the discriminative power, uh, maximize uh, the entropy of this neuron on describing this uh, test image set. But if we look at a particular person, for example, in the LFW, George Bush has 500 images, and you can find some neurons which always, uh, always uh, respond to George Bush. Right? And uh, you have uh, some other neurons which always uh, have zero response to Bush. So our training data and uh, the RFW have no overlap on the identity of the persons. 
And the similar thing also happened to the attributes. You can, you can find some neurons that always respond to the female, uh, male faces, have no response to female faces. So we, we found out these neurons, they have a strong selectiveness on the identities and also the attributes. And here we show you some example. This, uh, this neuron always uh, has the response to uh, Bush, and this neuron often has no response. And uh, we show you more examples on, on more pe uh, most uh, people. And this also happened to the identity. And this neuron always responds to uh, male faces, always a no response to female faces. They are on the contrary. And these uh, are the uh, race related attributes. For example, this neuron always responds to uh, white people and no response to other uh, uh, attributes related to the race. So this means that if you want to classify a single person from others or recognize a single attribute, so you probably can find a particular neuron which can have a very high recognition accuracy, even with a single neuron for recognition. And, um, uh, on the contrary, if uh, you, uh, you compare with the high-dimensional LPP, uh, you'll find the best of single feature from LPP for recognition. The recognition rate is, all, is, only, uh, 90, uh, is only 60 or 70 percent, quite low. Now we can also look at the, all the neuron responses. Here I sort these neurons uh, according their average uh, response uh, according to um, uh, to the uh, particular person from large to small, and then we can keep the order and uh, look at their average response to all the other images, and uh, we can see that it's a kind of a pretty uniform distribution on the other remaining images. And if you look at their recognition accuracy on single, uh, with a single neuron, and then we find out, uh, of course, these neurons, they have uh, good recognition capability on Bush because they always respond to Bush. And this, uh, this neuron, they also have good uh, recognition accuracy because they always have no response to Bush. And in the middle, you'll find some neurons that have a lot of uncertainties, right? So, but in comparison, and uh, for uh, high dimension LBP, if some feature have a high response to a particular uh, uh, bush, uh, a particular person, they also has a high response to other images, and they're not good for recognition. And here we also can visualize uh, the neuron. So for each neuron, we divide the images into three groups, high, uh, middle, and low response, and calculate the average image in each group. And then we can see that uh, uh, each neuron can have clearly a semantic meaning. For this, this one represents the gender, age, etc. So because of such, um, uh, make use of such uh, properties, we can actually um, simplify the uh, specify the network structure. As I mentioned, uh, because they have selectiveness on attributes, if you want to recognize a particular attributes, you only need a, a very small number of uh, neurons, and we can remove a lot of edges. And this is, uh, also happened to, uh, we can explore the correlation. Uh, between the neurons in different layers, right? So uh, if you want to predict a neuron at a higher layer, you only need to a uh, very few number of neurons from the lower layer. And so you can remove many uh, these kind of uh, connections. And so we propose to alternatively optimize the learning weights and also the structures, okay? You train, you train a, a dense network and uh, uh, specify the first layer and retrain the network and then uh, specify the uh, second layer and then and so on. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just, uh, I'm probably running out of time. I just give you the final result. And uh, this one is uh, you start with the dense, denser network and this is a sparse network. It only take uh, one, or one eighth of the amount of parameters, but even we got even higher recognition uh, performance. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, all the, uh, the remaining parts. So in summary, uh, I'm introduce uh, how to uh, learn the face uh, representation and also talk about there are uh, some empirical study on the properties. 
and also make use of such properties so we can make the network smaller. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we have some time for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, can you come forward uh, in front of the mic? Have you tried this on larger data sets where the pruning might not might hurt because you're less underfitting? Uh, you a lot. Of we uh, you mean the property of the neurons or the the whole? Uh, so the pruning uh, is probably helpful because you're working on a small data set, right? We do we do we don't have a special. We just uh, regular the pruning uh, pruning layers. No, the pruning, so removing edges. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, not high, but this, uh, so far, this uh, training, uh, training data, we still we have uh, 40, uh, 400,000 training images. It's, uh, training data is uh, still pretty large. Yeah. So do you have any idea how to, so what are the limitations of the current CNN that you're using, and how, what, what do you think? Is going to be the frontier, and in the next, you know, two three years, what do you think uh, you're going to work on and to improve? The uh, okay, system? yeah, I, I'm quite, quite interested in how to make the network smaller. So this, um, uh, we know that it's a uh, particular on face recognition, we have very good uh, recognition performance. But if you want to apply this to some uh, mobile phone and uh, um, camera to the front end, and then we, you, you want to make, you need to make it smaller. And also, we find. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, joint learning the weights and uh, also the structures uh, it's, uh, could be quite effective. And so that's um, one of the things. Over there. Yeah. So, so in some of the uh, early Deep ID work, you guys were using um, key points. Can you, can you comment on the importance of key points? And are they required, not required? What, what is your most uh, recent work? So this is uh, the, the key points uh, yeah. feature. So we, we use uh, in the face recognition we uh, because we uh, use multiple models. So basically, we crop multiple regions for each region to get a feature and then to do the prediction to the average. And if we if we need to crop multiple regions, then we rely on the key points, uh, kind of uh, handle this uh, uh, mis misalignment. But if you we use only use a single say single uh, model, single region for the face recognition, we only do very simple uh, geometric normalization rely on three key, key points. Yeah. Hi, um, this is really good work. Um, can I ask about a little bit about pruning? Since we also experimented with uh, CNN RSTM, and I'm curious on face recognition tasks, how many percent of the uh, parameters can be pruned, and what is the heuristic? We can remove more than 80% and uh, still get an even higher performance. Uh, and what is the heuristic you use for pruning? So basically, uh, you, 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 you start the uh, original network, and uh, you, you got the weights, and then you know the correlation between different neurons, and then you remove some uh, uh, connections which has weaker connect, um, uh, weaker uh, correlation in the first layer, and then you retrain the network, and then you uh, specify the second layer, and so on. So do this iteratively. Uh, so when you are specifying, specifying the first layer, the rest of the layers are fixed to be densely connected. Right, we, we, we fix it, and then we retrain the network, and then the second layer. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, so in the first part of the talk, you had um, stochastic latent variables representing pose and, and viewpoint or whatever, and, and then you use an EM procedure. And then you went on to just have a fully deterministic feed-forward network as usual and train it with SGD. When that second approach seemed to discover latent attributes, could it also discover latent viewpoints? In which case, do you need the hidden variable method? What, what are the pros and cons of those? So, so in the first one, we, we do have this, uh, this kind of uh, random neurons because we need to represent this uh, uh, viewpoint uh, information in a continuous way, so we we have really, uh, we have this uh, uh, properly model on this uh, uh, on this random neural uh, 
I'm sorry. What, what's the second question? Well, so in the second part of the talk, you're discovering um, latent attributes like gender and so on. Right, right. Uh, let's say gender is a bad example. Let's say race, which you can think of as a continuum. Viewpoint is also a continuum. Does it discover the viewing angle of the face organically, even though it wasn't labeled? Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, actually the, uh, the second part discovers uh, the properties. We are based on this. Uh, uh, we didn't use. Uh, we didn't. We only have the deterministic neurons. We di we don't have. Uh, it, it was not based on this model view physical uh, physical construction. Yeah. Okay, so we have one more. Yeah, last question. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on using this for anomaly detection? Like, for example, if you wanted to detect a mole on a face, but you didn't have any, or you had a very small amount of uh, mole training data, or even. I'm so so sorry, can you repeat again? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, have you? Do you have any thoughts about using this for anomaly detection? For example, detecting moles on the face. Uh, I haven't thought about it. Right? Uh, no, I, I guess this kind of example very rare in the in in, in the training data, and uh, I think the, the, for the current representation, probably is going to be hard. Is it because they learn from the normal, normal faces, and and what he was saying, kind of uh, some abnormal uh, regions, you know, right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's thank Xiao Huang again. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.